This is Self Work, and I'm Dr. Margaret Rutherford. At Self Work, we'll discuss psychological and emotional issues common in today's world and what to do about them. I'm Dr. Margaret, and Self Work is a podcast dedicated to you taking just a few minutes today for your own self work. Hello, and welcome to Self Work. I'm Dr. Margaret Rutherford. I'm a clinical psychologist out of Fayetteville, Arkansas, and I'm so glad you're here. I cannot believe this is episode 194, and I'm trying to make some plans for episode 200, and I've got a special request. You may have been listening to Self Work for just a short period of time, or maybe you're a regular listener, but what I want episode 200 to be all about is you. So if you'd use the speak pipe feature which can be found in the show notes or on my website at drmargaretrutherford.com in the sidebar. You just simply click on SpeakPipe, and you can leave me up to a minute and a half message. I'd just love to hear what you've learned from listening to self-work, basically what your own self-work has been. And also, if you can tell me where you're from, like, this is Liz from California, or this is Bob from South Africa, just wherever you are, I want to hear the diversity of all my listeners. I want to celebrate that. I'm so grateful to all of you. So, if you'll just take the five minutes to go on SpeakPipe, leave me a message, and I'll try to use as many of them as I can, because we've been doing this for four years together here at SelfWork. And I could not do it without you. So episode 200 will be all about you. I also want to thank you for the ratings and reviews you've left, the reviews on Amazon for my book, Perfectly Hidden Depression, How to Break Free from the Perfectionism that Masks Your Depression. I've gone up from 52 reviews to 75 reviews just in the last two weeks. And so many of you there say, yeah, I'm a listener of the podcast and I love it. So I tried out her book. My heart just sings when I see that, because sometimes the book is way down in the ratings, and then sometimes it'll get back up into the top 100, and you know, that's really not what matters. What matters is the message is getting out, but the ratings and reviews so help, as well as the ratings on Apple, especially for self-work. Self-work is all about reaching those of you who might already be interested in psychological and emotional issues. You may simply have just been diagnosed with depression or anxiety, or you're having a relationship problem, and you're looking for answers. And even to those of you who might not ever darken the door of a therapist, but are just interested enough to see what talking to a therapist might be like. Welcome to all of you. I had a patient say to me the other day, not in a complaining way, but sort of in a can't-believe-it kind of way, I've been in therapy with you now for a year. I, I thought I'd be here for maybe a couple of months. I want to share a bit of his story, as well as others who've used therapy not to simply make immediate changes in the direction they wanted or needed, but to make lasting change. I want to talk about making change that sticks I'm far from a psychoanalytic therapist that may believe, or at least when I was in graduate school, they would tout this, that for therapy to be successful, it needs to last years, and you should go multiple times a week. Most of us couldn't afford that anyway. In fact, if anything, I always tend to wonder what's happening when a clinician says for months or years on end that their therapy practice is closed. Does that mean no one's getting better? (laughs) Or leaving therapy to try out their own wings for a bit? I understand there are problems like eating disorders and complex trauma and chronic conditions that do take that amount of patience and time. And certainly I'm not criticizing that work. And actually, as I've said before, it's really all in the patient's perception of their own treatment that belief in it can be created. You know, what you choose often fits what you need. So if they feel like the relationship is solid and they're doing better, that's great. But today in this episode of Self Work, sponsored again by BetterHelp, we're going to focus in on what makes most change stick. Our listener email for today is from someone who says both he and his partner identify with perfectly hidden depression. So what to do there? So sorry for the long introduction. But I really am excited about the next five episodes of Self Work because we're roaring up to episode 200. So head over to Speak Pipe if you can. Again, either in your show notes or at drmargaretrutherford.com. Hmm. 
Recently, one of my telehealth patients said, I can't believe I've been in therapy for a year. He wasn't saying it to question whether or not it was still helpful because he'd changed for the better quite a bit. He's much more open to revealing emotions as he's gone through several years of trauma and never grieved or allowed anyone to see his pain. And he can identify the changes he likes and is seeking to open up even more. So my gentle response was this. Let's see. You've come in every other week for 12 months with a few misses. So let's say 52 weeks out of the year, half of that would be 26, take a few off. Let's say 22 sessions. That's 22 hours of talking, thinking, listening, revealing, developing insight, learning new habits, and replacing the old ones that were causing depression. It's not even a day. All basically with the backdrop of the coronavirus. I'd say that you're more than worth the 22 hours out of however many there are in a year, and I've actually Googled that, and it's 8,760. That's one hour every 398 hours. I think that's pretty good. So he laughed. Being a perfectionist, he smiled. Well, I thought I might do better than that. (laughs) I once again replied, of course you did, but maybe your yardstick was just a little too harsh or impatient. There certainly are wonderful therapeutic techniques that are meant to be more short-term. Maybe with this kind of issue, you're trying to change habits that are ingrained. There's ongoing work in the field on new techniques that are so exciting. For example, one technique uses what are termed neurohacks, and I'm quoting from an article by Sean Young in Psychology Today. Here we go, quote, Neural hacks get people to stick with things through two psychological processes. The first being that people convince themselves that if they're doing something without being pressured to do it, it must be important to them, such as you might ask, are you going to vote versus do you think of yourself as a voter? The second will actually have more sustained change because they want to think of themselves as a voter. They feel kind of pressured by saying, are you going to vote? They will stick with that behavior to remain consistent with what they have prioritized. Now, again, I'm still quoting from Sean Young. The second process is that people form an identity of themselves by looking back on things they've done in the past and will continue doing that behavior because it's part of their self-image. So basically, I guess neurohacking means, do you want to change your self-image? So that's kind of a shorter technique. So many problems are much more complex than changing negative or destructive habits, trauma especially. There are books being written about all kinds of techniques. I found an article in Good Therapy that talked about learning everything from what's called brain spotting and EMDR. And I'm quoting from that article. There is increasing evidence that trauma is stored in the body and that it can alter the way the brain works. Trauma can, for example, have an effect on emotions, memory, and physical health. Brain spotting seems to activate the body's innate ability to heal itself from trauma. End of quote. I've been trained in EMDR and have seen its worth and value. That's eye movement, desensitization, and reprocessing therapy. And actually what I've learned about brain spotting, and I'm going to include a link to the article so you can read more about it. It's really quite interesting to read about. And I've seen certainly EMDR's worth and value. And I just had a friend do a training in brain spotting, so I can't wait to, she's actually a massage therapist, and I think more and more kind of touch therapies are getting into this kind of thing. I'm sure we'll continue to learn much more about the relationship between our minds and bodies as we get more knowledge about our brains themselves. So far, the research seems to show that these body-mind therapies, that changes that come from them are lasting. In fact, I've had many people tell me that EMDR changed their life for the better. But what if the issue isn't the technique used? What if you've made great strides in therapy but don't know how to make those changes outside of therapy? Basically, what you may say to your therapist is, you know, I feel really comfortable in here and I come out of these sessions and I'm feeling hopeful, but I can't put what we talk about into practice. What if it feels as if the only time you can feel like the new you is with your therapist? Before we talk about this, let's hear a really wonderful offer from BetterHelp. When I was approached by BetterHelp now several months ago, COVID hadn't emerged. 
and I'd maybe conducted a handful of telehealth sessions, mostly when someone was sick and couldn't make it into the office. Now, five months later, I'm even more of a believer in telehealth. It took some getting used to, but actually, clients sometimes seem more relaxed. It fits better into their schedule. And although many have told me they miss seeing me in person, it's still been a very fulfilling relationship. I've even started new patients, and they've told me they had positive experiences, so we've never actually met in person. BetterHelp is rated the number one online therapy service that's available to you wherever you live. Confidential and highly personalized, it's much less expensive than normal talk therapy. You can text, have video chats, or just talk on the phone. You outline what you're looking for, and BetterHelp suggests several therapist options for you. If you don't seem to find a way to connect with one, they'll ask you more about what you're looking for and then suggest others. I, of course, tried it out before I was going to recommend it to you, and the two therapists I had sessions with listened well and made great suggestions for me, and one said, actually, I might make myself. I talked about my own panic disorder and a very scary situation I'd been through, and they were caring and thoughtful. And I was amazed at how easy it was to get in touch with them to make time changes, for example. Although BetterHelp can't be there in emergencies, nor could any online provider, they have all kinds of information about what you can do in that special circumstance. And today, BetterHelp has a great savings offer for you. If you use the link trybetterhelp.com slash selfwork, again, that's trybetterhelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash selfwork. You can enjoy a 10% discount on your first month of sessions. After five months of seeing how people relate to telehealth, I'd highly recommend it. If self-work has helped you, maybe BetterHelp can give you an even more personal experience with therapy. I tell almost every patient at some point in therapy, it's my job to do myself out of a job. The litmus test for when someone is ready to leave therapy is if the changes they've made in their lives with your support or in the therapy room with you, they've also found support for in their life outside of their relationship with you. And that is very unique to each patient. In fact, it's one of the things I learned in graduate school, that whatever emotional safety you as a therapist can provide for your patient, then that's only part of your job. The second part is to help them build those safe relationships with other people. Often in a particular stage of especially deeper work on depression or trauma, there is a sense of dependence that's fostered in therapy. I'll hear things like, I couldn't wait to get into my session this week to talk about this, or I thought about what you might say to me as this was happening this week. That's called internalization of me, actually, of the therapist. Basically, my client is remembering and trusting in the relationship they formed with me, looking forward to talking with me and gaining whatever it is they gain from these conversations, but also beginning to know or internalize what my response or question might be. Even though that can sound like dependence, all of that is a great sign that they're beginning to carry out of the therapy room what's been gained within the therapeutic setting, within their relationship with me. The seeming dependence or perceptions of the therapist's response differs with each personality style, each disorder, and each individual. But the closer it comes to them being able to say, I could hear our conversation in my head, not literally, but they could hear what I might say, and then they think this is what I'd say. They're beginning to soothe themselves. They're beginning to know and trust what's coming as consistent, safe, even predictable. Of course, you may see something as a therapist you didn't see before. You, hopefully you do. In fact, hopefully you're figuring out some things along the way that are fresh and new. You might add another fresh perspective. But the goal of the work is to encourage your patient to create in other relationships what they feel they have with you. In fact, I will say I've been seeing a patient now who's very seriously depressed and has to fend off suicidal thoughts Every six or eight months, he's getting ketamine right now, and that's really helping. But I had a session with him just this week where I sort of had my own aha moment and picked up some of the things in our work through the couple of years I've seen him 
And I don't know why I didn't have that insight before, but suddenly I was clear about something and it was helpful to him. So obviously things happen that are new. But the internalization process is more they can imagine their conversations with you and find those conversations that they can imagine soothing. And basically, when they begin to be able to do that and form relationships with others in their lives that mimic their relationships with you, where they find support, where they find care, where they find people who tune in, where there's both give and take in the relationship, basically, your job is over as a therapist. Because they have others in their lives that will offer maybe a challenge when needed, support, perspective. They have people they trust and that then they can do the same thing for. Now, sometimes those people are harder to find. Sometimes someone struggles to let go with a therapeutic relationship. But most often, relatively healthy people want to see themselves as getting it, whether that's seeing more clearly a pattern in their own behavior and catching it before it causes havoc. They've desired to have support, but haven't known how to ask for or where to find it. But now they're beginning to do so. Think of all this as if you were going to a medical doctor. She's told you the warning signs to look for to gauge if some chronic problem you're experiencing is beginning to pop up again, even when just managing basic health issues. And so you do. You realize you're not sleeping or your blood pressure is up or you're letting your sugars get out of hand or you're eating a bunch of junk food. When you know you can maintain your own physical health fairly well, and you may even have a support system in place to help you do that, it feels great. You've got a walking buddy or someone who will gently remind you that you're getting a bit grumpy because you're not sleeping, or you haven't taken a day off of work in months, whatever. But what if you were dependent on your MD to remind you of those things, that you couldn't think of them yourself or you didn't have anybody in your world to help? You'd be in their office all the time and getting the same reminders you always get. And there are some folks like that. Mental health is similar. There's some tried and true ways of maintaining good mental health, a support system, exercise, getting good rest, not overworking, journaling, mindfulness and meditation, keeping worry to a minimum or at least where it's constructive. (laughs) Did I mention a support system? Really important. And catching patterns. Noticing if you're over or underreacting, if you're getting short with people, if you're drinking more or smoking more weed, if you're staying on social media or video gaming for hours every day, you can become aware not only of your choices, but of the consequences of those choices. Okay, I realize this may sound as if it's turning into a lecture. What's most important to hear from me is that therapy works best when you're putting what you've learned into practice, just like in medical health. And basically, what you've internalized about the therapy relationship, what you've gained from it, the things you know that you hear from session to session, the way you thought about thinking about things, the process has changed, you think more deeply about things, you look for patterns, then you can take what you've learned in therapy and apply it and find other people who've either been in therapy themselves and know exactly what you're talking about or teach other people about what you've learned. As I've said often, insight is great and can often lead to powerful moments of understanding, but where you find hope is when you're thinking or acting or believing differently. So whatever technique you try, no matter what the theoretical bent of your therapist and how you're collaborating with them to work on your issues, to make your change stick takes you taking what you've learned and applying it to your real life. I'm sure you've heard yourself say, or others say, I may have studied how to do what I do in school, but I didn't learn how to do it until real life. Mental health is like that as well. I can remember some of the first patients I saw that had problems that I'd never studied in graduate school, and I thought, oh my gosh, how do I do this? And sure enough, I learned. Therapeutic change that sticks is like that. You can understand yourself better with your therapist, feel and express painful things in therapy you've never felt or expressed, laugh about things in therapy that you don't laugh about outside of that environment. All of that is learning how to be vulnerable, to honor all of you, to learn how to see yourself with compassion and accept yourself. And the important word is and. And establish how you're going to get those same things in the real world with friends, with family, with friends who become your family, 
with coworkers, with those you choose to trust and be open with. People do come in all the time in therapy for tune-ups, or maybe something has happened that suddenly they feel the need to return for longer. That's not failure. Sometimes life hands us things that challenge us, and a known working relationship with a therapist can come in handy as one more manic stage emerges, or another bout of anorexia raises its head, or you've had a loss that you simply don't know what to do with. So you go back into therapy. It just means you're handling things well. It's good management. Let me say that again. Returning to therapy doesn't equate with failure. It means that you're managing things well and with responsibility. Whether therapy takes a month, a year, more years than that, that doesn't matter. Some people may not need it to continue, but actually have the desire and the means to have a thought guide, sort of, a therapeutic mentor, and that's fine as well. That's work that may not have as definitive an end, but it feels more like coaching. But, or should I say probably and, you also want to hopefully learn in therapy to have the confidence to say to your therapist, I think I've got this. I want to try this on my own. Thank you. But for now, you're out of a job. Our listener email today is from someone who really identifies with perfectly hidden depression, as does his wife. So here's his email. I've read your book on perfectly hidden depression and listened to many of your podcasts. It's been eye-opening and such a relief to hear this and know I'm not crazy. Thank you for that. I do have a question regarding myself and my spouse. We both feel we're suffering from perfectly hidden depression. Our marriage is struggling, and I'm not sure if you have any podcast I can listen to where both partners have perfectly hidden depression and how to work through this. I don't have a podcast like that, although in the book I do talk about the fact that When perfectionism is your standard and you also are very uncomfortable with conflict or painful emotions. And so you may seek out someone who's just like that, who also doesn't like to talk about painful things and is very perfectionistic. So y'all have sort of a Ken and Barbie life or I guess the uh, maybe Beyonce and (laughs) Jay-Z, something like that. You create this incredible persona of everything's just fine. So here's my response. Thanks so much for reading the book and for reaching out. Sorry, it's taken me a bit to get back with you. First, I don't think it's odd at all that perhaps both of you have sought each other out. Neither of you may be comfortable with conflict, so both of you have worked together to avoid it. Both of you are successful, but don't let others see your vulnerability. It might have been quite comfortable, at least for a while. You don't mention to me the why you chose to read about it, but I'd imagine that something's getting more despairing or lonely for at least one of you. You say your marriage is in trouble, so maybe that's what it was. Or maybe something else has triggered it or called attention to something from your past, her past, or both. Perfectly hidden depression is a term I've created. So there are no people trained in perfectly hidden depression out there. Maybe one day I'm actually thinking about writing a therapist manual. But perfectionism has long been seen as something problematic. And if you both carry a lot of shame, that's even more dangerous and self-destructive. What you do have to find is someone who's adept at working with couples in a deep way, not someone who's going to hand you a practice sheet. You'll do those practice sheets perfectly and then leave therapy. So when you go on someone's website and read about how they work, or when you talk to them for the first time, ask them, what kind of work do you do with couples? Are you more cognitive behavioral or do you do deeper work than that? Do you go into potential traumas in their lives that are affecting them as individuals and thus their relationship? You may have to try out a couple of therapists, but again, asking around is always the best, and I know that's hard for people who are hiding. But someone who's either probably a marriage and family therapist or a PhD might be best. I don't know, the social workers and LPCs may be mad at me when I say that, but In fact, social workers might be trained in family systems work, but someone trained in family systems work would be really good, or trauma, or both. Then what you can do is enter the therapeutic relationship with my book in hand so they themselves can read what has spoken to you loud and clear. Good luck to you. If you lived in Arkansas, I would have loved to help, but I'm sure there are many capable therapists where you are. If I can help in any other way, please let me know.
I wish I could see so many of you who contacted me saying you identify with perfectly hidden depression and want to work with me. I am in Arkansas and I'm only licensed right now to work with people who reside in Arkansas. But Arkansas is, the legislature is considering joining what's called SIPACT. And if we do, then it's a possibility that I could work with people from other states. More to come. Thanks again for being a part of Self Work. I want to give a quick reminder about going to SpeakPipe here in your show notes or on my website at drmargaretrutherford.com and leaving me a message about what you've learned by listening to Self Work, what it means to you, what you look forward to, anything, as we celebrate 200 episodes on October the 2nd, I think. If you do go to drmargaretrutherford.com, you can subscribe there. It's a really easy way to keep up with the podcast as well as my weekly blog post. It's easy to subscribe. You can email me at askdrmargaret at drmargaretrutherford.com, and I do read all my emails. I may or may not be able to specifically get back to you, but I do try to address the issues that so many of you ask me about. Perfectly Hidden Depression is a book now on sale at Amazon, Barnes & Noble, or you can go to your local bookstore. I've had so many people tell me that they really don't think they experience perfectionism, but they've gone on and read the book, and that it is helpful in and of itself, because it has over 60 exercises that really are applicable or applicable, however you say that word, (laughs) to anyone. It's deeper work. It's not easy work. And so... Take care while you're reading it, but I'd love for you to get a copy. It's Even the paperback is under $15, so it's not a heavy investment, but I hope that it's an incredible investment in yourself. I saw that many of you actually listened to the little five-minute or two-minute segments talking about a course I gave, Perfectionism Meets Pandemic, and right now the first half of that workshop is available at drmargaretrutherford.com slash workshop and we're about to get the second half of that course for free on again drmargaretrutherford.com slash workshop I don't think the second course is up quite yet but you can at least listen to the first if you're interested it's still there and we'll be there for quite a while I'm having fun over on Instagram. I'm still on my road to 100 things I've learned as a therapist. And right now, today was number 58, I think. (laughs) So I'm having fun and hopefully posting some things that are also meaningful. I want you all to know how much I appreciate you being here. I'm very grateful to all of you. So thanks so much. Please take very good care. Stay safe and sane. I'm Dr. Margaret. And this has been Self Work.